Courtney Good Bush. morning. Oh. oh, see, God damn it, we can never do it. We right. finally committed to both discuss, both starting off the, the conversation. <laughs> we came in hot. I just said good morning. Good morning. It's past noon here, but I, I took a nap, so I do feel like it's still morning. Um, what were you gonna say about Eva? Oh, I just felt like we said, okay, let's go record, and then she hid herself on Zoom, and then she always records the video. And so we all said, okay, bye, let's start recording. And then I said, actually, I need to eat this sandwich. And I think she just sat there and watched me eat a sandwich until I hovering I, over the record button. <laughs> I don't know about Eva, but as, uh, you know, the connoisseur of sandwiches, I understand. <laughs> I'm sure yes. I have done it and I'm sure I will do it. So I, uh, I just had to get that in my system and I have my coffee. I'm good to go, Em. Um. I like your little your Bucky's sweatshirt. Oh, thank you. I do too. It's it's a nice tie dye number. I uh, know, we, but the 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 color palette is very you. Yeah, I guess I. Uh, it's like a teal tie dye. I bought it when we were in uh, where were we? Dallas and Houston recently. <laughs> I was gonna say in Bucky's. I don't where know. Where <laughs> were we? I have no idea. I don't know where I am most times. But um, M, hi. Why do you drink this week? Oh man. Well, I drink right now because I'm sleepy because it's, yeah. I'm a very lucky person where 9 a.m. is early for me. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm also a very unlucky person that my my bedtime, I can't control it. I, I would love to go to bed earlier. So that way nine doesn't feel so scary to me. But, you know, but no, uh, but no. So I'm just sleepy today. Also, um, I got to see Black Panther last night, which was. Oh, very how fun. was it? Uh, it was really good. By the time this comes out. um. It will have already opened for everybody else, but um, it was weird. It was a like it was a good movie, but it was just we everyone. There was a lot of pressure, obviously, from the people who yeah. made it to like figure out how Chadwick mm -hmm. was going to be written out of the movie, and they really handled it. And they um, gave you multiple opportunities to cry. And because I oh, went to boy. a, a because I went to a pre-screening with a bunch of Marvel fans and I was very, very lucky. I'm aware of um, how grateful I should be that I got to be in an audience that was primarily uh, people of color getting to see someone who represents them That's on great. the big screen. And it was, you could feel the pride in the room and you could feel their sorrow during the really sad parts of people saying goodbye to Chadwick. And um, oh. obviously I, you know, can't relate entirely but to be in a room full of people where you could you knew what they were feeling and mm -hmm. you were just so happy for them it was I hope that doesn't come off as performative but I was I was just sitting in the theater and I was just like so I was like wow I'm I get to like see this like basically before opening night with like all the people who care the most about that's this. so and powerful I love that it was really 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 touching and um I made friends Good. That's, which is I was not expecting to do. Who was actually, and by made friends, that sounds like I actively um, sought out people and knew how to network. No, um, someone there recognized me. No, and <laughs> and, and then um, they said that uh, they felt really awkward to approach me all night, so they didn't. They waited until like after the movie, and we were in the parking lot. Okay, so that happens a lot. Like not a lot, but like when that does happen, where people are like, "Oh, I saw you, and I was too nervous to approach you, so I waited." That always like throws me off because it's like, "Oh, so you've been watching?" Like, oh, they admitted that they had it. No, I know, but then to me, I'm like, <laughs> "Oh my god, what was I doing? Did I pick my nose?" Like, oh, what? I, I, oh my god, I outed myself about every horrible thing I did while I was there because. Um, I was afraid that they were watching and they were. So I'm glad that I said something because I was very awkward there. I didn't know. I was just, I'm, I was so intimidated because there were a lot of famous people in the room, um, especially like TikTokers. Like I saw at least 10 TikTokers that I follow pretty actively. Cool. And uh, they were, people were like asking people for pictures and stuff. And I like just felt weird I know I need to get over it, but like to, to go up and shake someone's hand who like, I don't want to bother them, but obviously they're there to be bothered. But like, do they really want to be bothered? So like I, it was a weird dynamic. And so I ended up just because Allison wasn't there either. I didn't have a plus one with me. So I just kind of like walked around alone and you like, lurked. I lurked and I felt really creepy about it. And so eventually no. I just like went and sat on, um, 
I sat on a couch for a while because I didn't know how to react. They had really good food. They had really good chicken wings. I had a lot of chicken wings. But then I, also that's not like a very classy food to eat if you're trying no, to network. Especially by yourself because you're just like you're yeah. hyper aware <laughs> of yourself eating. <laughs> yeah. And uh, and then the other thing that I did that was really awkward was so they have a photo op. They had one at the Thor thing too. But um, at, for the, the Black Panther one, we, everyone was being instructed that like it was like a like a 10 second video that like would loop and you could put it on your socials and stuff. But they were being instructed like how to move with the, the props and everything and the, and the set that they had built. Mm -hmm. And they were just telling everyone like, Oh, and at the end you're going to do the Wakanda forever sign. Mm -hmm. And I just didn't personally feel super comfy as a white person doing Mm -hmm. it. Not that I, not that I would feel like I'd be appropriating anything, but I just, I felt like this was a moment for like the black community. And I just didn't want to, you know, I don't know. I felt awkward. And so I was like, I'm not going to do that. So there were a few times where I got in line and then I got too uncomfortable and I was like, I'm going to leave. So apparently they watched me every time I got in line no. and then like awkwardly <laughs> snaked out. <laughs> oh my so... God. Um... And then they watched me apparently eat chicken wings and they saw me sitting on the couch by myself. So it was. <laughs> so what a good friend. That's how good friendship is born, you know? Well, they said that they, it made me feel better when they were like, oh, well, we felt really scared to approach you. What's and their I name? Was Amber and James. Oh, there's two. Yeah, I think they're a couple. And oh. uh, but they felt um, they said they felt really uncomfortable to approach me. And then I listed all the things I had done that were horribly obvious social anxieties. And <laughs> uh, but then we all said like, okay, so we're all anxious. And apparently they also get invited to these events a lot. And so I was like, okay, well next time you see me, please approach me so I don't look alone. <laughs> and uh, so now we've agreed that at the next one we will um, all sit together. So Aww, look how anyway, special. I had a great time and um, thank you. Shout out to Straw Hat Goofy, who's a, one of my favorite um, Marvel TikTokers for inviting me. Ooh. So. And I'll end on this last thing. I know I'm taking up so much time, but no, you're good. I came back from a Marvel screening people. Like, come on. What do you um, expect? So have i told you about this before that i like somehow on instagram became friends with um one of the cast members from black panther what no okay so there's in black panther there the wakandan army it's like this this very elite army yes i've watched black panther yes okay okay so i'm friends with one of the women in the door oh cool and uh she was very very kind i did not expect this but she dm'd me after they wrapped and said like can i send you a shirt from set and i went oh that's so nice and so i got to wear the black panther shirt at Uh, the black panther screening and it was just a it was a great great time so anyway that's i love that that's so sweet i had a lot of fun so anyway the end uh wow what a time to be alive for m schultz yes I was just in bed texting you um, <laughs> that I was hoped you were having a great time, but I was not doing anything nearly as fun or exciting. What were you doing and why do you drink? Okay, I have a real reason. Um, and this one is, I meant to bring it up last week, but we talked so much about my ghosty stuff that um, it just didn't fit. But I wanted to bring up something else that happened recently that I was so proud of and excited about, which is that I had like six lucid dreams (gasps) and I'm like getting so much better at it. And I'm just so excited about it because I'm like really trying. You haven't told me any of this. Oh, my gosh. I know. That's why I that's why it's like killing me that. um, Tell me everything. Okay, let me see what where I, I I wrote a note somewhere. Hold on. (laughs) <laughs> oh god okay i don't know half this stuff doesn't really make any sense on my uh so oh here so it is i found it i found it. i was gonna say your note taking it has not my uh, note taking is not improved no um my notes app on my phone is probably almost as messy as my gmail inbox it's just like it's just chaos um so i took so this is if, if Pro tip, if anyone's trying to lucid dream, um, mm-hmm. always write down your dreams is is a big one. And then go to bed with the intention of lucid dreaming is a big one. And then number three, you're most likely to have a lucid dream in like a, during a nap because you're you're in that hypnagogic state 
Mm. Um, and so yeah. you're much more likely to to have a lucid dream. And so I we had done an interview like freaking early in the morning. Um, it was early for you. It was like five thirty in the morning your time, or maybe that's late for you because you're still awake. <laughs> I don't I don't really know. <laughs> Honestly, me either. <laughs> I, <laughs> Um, that day in particular, I did stay up until 5.30. You just did? So, oh, God. Yeah. Well, because I go to bed at like 4, and I was like, I'm not going to go to bed for an hour just to absolutely miss yeah. this interview. So, yeah. Well, w- we did the interview. It's like 10 minutes. I was very annoyed. And then I went back to sleep. And during that dream or during that nap, I had six different lucid dreams because I kept waking up. And then being like, mm. oh, my God. And then I would fall back asleep and re-enter the lucid dream. And I was like, this is so fun. Oh, um, that's so cool. So uh, it was cool because I could wake up and think like, well, now what do I want to do in my lucid dream? <gasps> and then I would like re-enter my lucid dream. So a lot of it was like I kept waking up and falling back asleep. So I f- forgot. Like I didn't write it down because I was just trying to like stay asleep. Um, but the one that I remember the most vividly is that I flew out my window in my bedroom and I flew down the street and I was like looking at my neighborhood Mm -hmm. and we have in Newport there's like a main street called Monmouth and it has all these like antique shops and diners and just like little boutiques and old timey butcher shops and stuff and I was flying over and I was like oh my god I have the coolest idea I'm gonna say I'm gonna set an intention like you basically just say I want to do this or I want to see this and it happens so I said in my dream I want to see monmouth street in the 1880s and it was like this you can do that yes it was the co- m it was the coolest thing ever it was how how does your brain even i don't into know that? and that's, that's the thing it's, it, it's like my mind must have just been like okay let's invent this you know yeah like do you think it was actually time accurate or was no, it your version no of what i think it was looks m- like my mind creating it okay um I did assume, you actually time travel no like i assume and i mean there are definitely people who believe like lucid dreaming you can like ask uh, you know travel like um uh astral project astral travel that kind of thing and so like maybe but i mean i'm assuming this is just my subconscious like inventing what i was looking at sure um but it was i literally just said i want to see newport kentucky in the 1880s and it was like this like like everything just like transformed and there were like horses and oh, um, not horses i my <laughs> Did you take away not horses? <laughs> What's wrong with horses? My my goose cam is like crazy oh, right now. I can't. Oh, believe- M, it was so cool. And then I land. Like so, then I was flying around, right? And then I was like, "Ooh, I'm gonna walk around and just like pretend like I'm part of this neighborhood oh. in the 1880s." And so I'm walking around, and I was like, I touched a building, and I was like, "Shut up!" This is so freaky because I was touching the brick, and I was like, "This just you feels like feel I'm it? touching a brick." Yeah, I was like, "This is tripping me out." So then I went into a pub, and I was like. Hi, can I have a beer? <laughs> like I didn't know what to do. And they were like, I'm um, sure. But then I felt like they were all looking at me kind of funny. And so I walked out and um then across the street they had like a um like a little brothel and I was like, I'm gonna go in there. So then I walked in there and I think that's when I woke up. Um because my brain was like, I don't know, eighteen eighties brothel, that's a lot to conjure right now. Um, I would have been like, well, when in Rome, I would have been like, <laughs> no, I tried. I walked in and then like I woke up and I was like, damn it. Um, mm, but it I was see, so I cool. I was walking through cobblestone, like alleys and stuff. Can you imagine and- if Astral, you snapped your fucking ankle on cobblestone? <laughs> I woke up like, what? why is my leg hurt so much? <laughs> my my soul leg is broken. Oh, anyway. So I just wanted to tell you about that because I was so excited. Um and I had taken to sleeping with um, my selenite crystal on my nightstand. And I uh, I think it was probably just, you know, again, like in my uh, placebo. But I was like, t- you know, because selenite is meant to be help you dream and that kind of thing. So I don't know. It's just, uh, listen, it's a good time. It's so magical. Wow. It feels like That's... magic because you're fully oh. conscious. You're just like, I'm inventing the world. My idea of magic was being in an audience for Black Panther last night, but oh, I sorry, <laughs> not everyone can go to cool uh, Hollywood premieres. Okay, no, I feel like I feel like that would really. I'm very excited for you, but I don't think I could get into that. I think I would be so overwhelmed. I think well, I it's would very be, overwhelming. I I think I honestly I That's think why I'd I kept be more up. tired. <laughs> I think I'd be more tired. I have to keep going back to bed afterwards. That's probably what I did. Uh, That's why I probably fell asleep six more times, but. It, it was just that, really cool. It's so 
<sighs> it's I'm, almost unbelievable. It does. It's, it seems ridiculous, doesn't it? I yeah. Like if I if I were a skeptic who was not open to this stuff, I'd be hearing you talk and I'd be like, we need to put her somewhere. But it's not even. <laughs> but it's not like it's not even like anything supernatural. It's just like you're you're awake in your own dream, so you can just do what you want. It's like so it's crazy. not anything like paranormal or supernatural. It's just I like, know it's just it's so so hard to wrap my head around that like you could actually touch the brick and like choose I'm freaky. gonna walk on the cobblestone that, and I'm I'm gonna walk like when you were walking down the street where people looking at you like did you feel like I would have it would have very quickly turned into a nightmare where everyone was staring at me a little too hard. And, I think like, it's like you since you know you're dreaming you're sort of like well I can just vanish if I want or I can wake up if I want like you you're very much like in control of the situation it's not like um that movie one of my favorite movies um not Shutter Island what's the other one Leo's in is Leo in that catch me if you can no that's my favorite one hold on (laughs) I'm obsessed with Leonardo in city no not in city inception inception thank you uh so it's not quite like that where like you're in a dream and you can't escape and everyone who notices you like it's not sinister like that i mean maybe it can be but um it's more like you have full control over your surroundings so you could be like well i don't want anybody to be in you can be like vanish and everyone can vanish you know what i mean like you can i think that's the part that's unbelievable for me because i'm so i'm not as um uh I don't know what the right word is, but I haven't been practicing as long as you have. I really haven't been practicing at all. I think when I lucid dream, it's accidental. And so I don't know how to control it. And most of the dreaming that I have is once I'm aware that I'm dreaming instantly becomes a nightmare because I'm, I have all these fears of like, Oh "Oh." no, (laughs) I'm like, Oh, well, what if this happened? That would suck. And then it uh, happens. Older incoming. (laughs) (laughs) All of a sudden I'm in a horror movie every time. What you're, well, I've read books that teach you how to like pull out of that cycle and stuff. So, so there's definitely ways out of it if you ever want to approach it, but, or re, re, Read. consider it yeah <laughs> oh. or read or read if you ever want to read i thought you were like i thought you were roasting me. I thought, <laughs> if you wanna... read. no you did that yourself thank you for doing that for me um that was my insecurities showing i think um, i read it on audible okay so you could even do that i think okay um okay. anyway i know this is long i just want to say it's really cool and if you're interested in lucid dreaming um you definitely should try it out it's 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 fun it's hard to get to but like i feel like once you start doing it it's kind of easier for your brain mm. to like pick up on it. Um, anyway, that's all. And uh, oh, I know the last thing. What I realized when I woke up, I was so mad at myself. I was like kicking myself. I was like, I wanted to visit M's apartment because on rituals, we had talked about lucid dreaming and you said you wrote a note for me. Did you actually write a note? Mm-hmm. Where is it? You, you, you would find it if you were here. Is it there right now? Mm-hmm. Okay. So I wasn't sure if it was there. So I was like, okay. Next time I have a lucid dream, I'm going to go to your apartment, look for the note and just see what my brain decides your note says, because it'll it be my be, own invention in my head. It would be real fucking freaky. I, yeah. Yeah. I'm we'll do a test. Not, I'm actively not saying anything so we can test your ESP or whatever it is. It's going to be something that my brain thinks that you wrote to me. And I'm very curious what my subconscious thinks that you wrote to me on a post-it. Is it on a post-it? No. Okay. All right. I'll just, I mean, I'll maybe. just. I don't know. I'll just try. No, I'll try and find it. Okay, cool. I also now am going to be changing the message on it because um, no. Well, because I definitely don't want to do something that you could guess. You know, Mm. like it has to be completely random, right? Well, no. Well, I mean, I'm just. I believe it'll just be my own invention in my head. I don't think I'll actually be showing up at your apartment. I think this is... I don't know. I I think it'd be real fucking freaky, so we might as well try. Okay, let's just leave it what it is. Yeah, okay. Unless you want to write a different one, but let's just leave it as what it is, and I'll try to um, to visit you. Do some snooping? Yeah. It won't be hard. It's not... I'm not. It didn't make a fucking escape room for you, so it's you not know, hidden. Okay, not again. It's gonna be um, booby trapped. So the room's gonna be booby trapped. <laughs> if I knew how to booby trap spirits or souls, uh, we would all be in trouble. I mean, I'm gonna so. break my ankle again. Uh, my other ankle. <laughs> There's actually the floor is just covered in mouse traps. So just and I, I have to very daintily get in here to sit down. Um, okay, sorry, that was so long, but um, that's no, all. No, you're good. We both had like 
great experiences. We what need a to time. Talk about. I can't believe, uh, I feel like we've really been hitting it lately. We're like, we're just coming Damn, in hot we're with on the a roll. Like I got to go to a fucking Marvel screening and I had the theater reaction that like you always see on, on TikTok and stuff where like people are like freaking out in their seats. I ha- got to have that. That's was, fun. That, it was that's very fun. fun. And because it was such a dark movie to navigate because mm-hmm. they were, everyone was grieving. Um, they had uh there were parts where people were like jumping out of their seats but then there were also parts where like not a dry eye in the house it was Mm. so so sad um and the worst part is like all of the the grieving scenes you knew they were actually crying for him it was like that's terrible it was a whole other level because it wasn't like oh that's great acting it was like no they're literally thinking about their dead friend it was i want to agree with you but every time you put your hand over your face your hand has eyebrows again and i'm like um (laughs) okay fool okay (laughs) (laughs) moving on moving on moving on okay this is uh i don't know what i would categorize this um i guess a mystery um it could be aliens it's this is one where you get to throw your ideas your theories <gasps> your my way if you'd like to i you you know i would like to okay well this is the disappearance of fred valentick oh oh the valentich mystery valentich okay well thank you i think well you already know more than that. No, I don't think so. I, I've definitely heard about this on, of course, Astonishing Legends, um, but I don't really remember. Okay, well, Astonishing Legends always nails it with several hours long info, and yeah. I know nobody wants to hear me talk that long. So I'm, I'm here quite is... sure it's Valentich. Good to know going into this. All right. There's an H at the end, right? <laughs> uh huh. Oh, yeah, Valentich. I didn't know if it was like a hard. No, I don't think so. I don't know. All right. I'm going to rock with what you're saying. Um, So starting out hot, Fred Valentich was born in 1959. He is a Gemini. Mm. We love to see it. June Mm. 9th. And, See, this uh, is the stuff Astonishing Legends doesn't cover. Right. You know right. what this I mean? This is the hard-hitting news. This is the stuff we need to really dig deep to get. <laughs> I don't know what research you wanted, but you could find... If it's not here, go to Astonishing Legends. Um... So Fred Valentich is uh, born in 1958, and he grows up to be an Australian pilot. Um, He also grows up to be a flying saucer enthusiast and firm believer in UFOs. Love that that's part of the resume. That's, it's really his whole resume, and that's about it. So Fred has a dad. His name is Guido, which- Oh, yeah. As someone who just finished watching all of Jersey Shore in like five days, (laughs) loving that. Um. And Guido said that Fred, uh, Fred, quote, studied UFOs as a hobby using information he got from the Air Force, which <gasps> like, damn, that's yeah. pretty bananas. Uh, and he apparently took his research very seriously. Um, his father even said that this is another quote. He was not the kind of person uh, who would make up stories. Everything had to be very correct and positive. So mm-hmm. he's. For a Gemini, he's giving Capricorn. Like, he's giving, Yeah, it must be his moon or rising signs. Must be Earth signs, you know? Because that... I feel like that doesn't track for me, a triple airhead. (laughs) Yeah, no, I don't know what's going on in Fred's uh, star chart. But (laughs) I will tell you, Mm -hmm. uh, he is not messing around when it comes to UFOs. He takes... Very uh, fascinated by evidence and research and facts. Great. Um, and his love for UFOs is possibly responsible for uh, Fred's dream of being a pilot, always wanting to be in the sky. Nice. Um, here's the thing. You're going to learn to, I don't know if love Fred is the right word, but certainly sympathize with Fred. Uh, Fred was not very good at being a pilot. No. <laughs> he, Fred just Fred. He tried his best. And he just wasn't having it. Um, so starting right off the bat it, in his teen years, he tried to enlist in the Royal Australian Air Force, but they denied him for not being educated enough, mm. um, which somehow becomes a theme. Um, oh, no. Not being not educated as in like he didn't go to the right school. It's like he really somehow it wasn't clicking for him. On like he just wasn't pilot. passing probably the tests. He was not passing. Um, got it. Got it. So and since he couldn't get in, I mean, he tried to enlist twice and both times they were mm. like, get out of here, Fred. Then he joins their training corps to help, quote, oh. air, to help, 
air-minded youth, which I love that. Wow. I feel like air-minded youth, though, is very close to air-headed youth. I was going to say, air-headed youth, I understand. I think I would walk into the wrong classroom and be like, <laughs> this is not what I thought it was going to be. Maybe Fred was an airhead, but trying to be an air-mind. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, good for him. Um, So he joined their training course so he could get involved into in the... Uh, Air, into their air force and in 1977 which she's now 19 um he gets his private pilot license um and he is now very quickly moving on to setting for his commercial pilot license good for him i mean also not very gemini to be so committed to this path and being like so um what's the word uh what's the word um I, girl i don't dedicated know. i don't know like last doing... time last time i tried to help i called myself out for not reading so yeah you know. that's true <laughs> uh what's the word when you're 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 oh my god now i have it like committed committed maybe is what i'm trying to think like that he just keeps trying you know what i mean like he has chutzpah yeah he sure does um, he's determined determined thank you that's the word you were determined to Eva figure texted out the word. diligent which also <laughs> diligent but maybe not diligent enough to pass the test, but definitely <laughs> determined. Like he's like, he's trying over and he's, over again. He's got the moxie for it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, okay. But he, so now he's got his private pilot license. He's on his way to his commercial or he's trying for his commercial, but he's still not very good at being a pilot just because he got his license. <laughs> oh no. I feel like we should question who gave him the license, who said like, okay, fine. You can be a private pilot license. <laughs> um, determined. See? Yeah, so he, just to give you an example of how, um, so before you can get your commercial license, you have to fly for 1,500 hours. Okay. At only 150 hours, he had already been in three pretty big incidents. <gasps> oh, um, no. Which, if you do the math, if that means every 50 flying hours, he is putting himself in a oh really my stupid situation. God. <laughs> um, And so... He, so the incidents, one was that he flew into restricted airspace, Mm-mm. which, uh, you know, not good. Because, I imagine that's a big no-no. Yeah. So in restricted airspace, there are planes that are already already have their flight plans and are already flying around. And now he is just flying in and could, oh. it's like, it's like just going full speed ahead into like a very busy parking lot. And it's like sounding more airheaded youth every time you tell me another story. <laughs> like he, uh, you're right that I'm connecting on some, some deep level. There is a weird, like it's one of those underdog gloves where you're like, you really hope he, he doesn't I fuck just, it up this time. Yeah. I just <laughs> like, I so understand how he's feeling. I just want him to, to figure it out, you know? Yeah. So he flies into restricted airspace and uh, risks crashing into another aircraft the other two times that were uh, incidents within the first hundred hours of his mm. flying, um, he flew into clouds and he couldn't. Is that see- bad? Yeah. So especially when you're that new, like it's oh, not whoa, bad whoa. once you're actually. A, I was like, like I've you know definitely flown through a cloud, not me personally, but like on an airplane. No. Been so like this is a cloud that I'm inside. Once you're, uh, once you know what you're doing, and if you're in the right plane, got then you, it's got fine you. to fly through a cloud. But he, he was in a plane that didn't have the instruments you need to fly blind. Um, uh-huh. And so, because if you're in a cloud, you can't see, and you have to rely on the computer instruments, of the, right? Yeah. And it, the plane didn't have it, and so he truly was that's very just dangerous, coasting through. <laughs> in like, I think the that's worst. sort of how John Denver died. Oh, is it? You know, he his instrumentation. He either didn't trust his instrumentation, um, and trusted his gut, which like you're not supposed to do because it can get you can get really mixed up. Um, mm. And I think he just kept, if I remember correctly, kept flying higher and higher, and um, Ooh, in his oh own no. plane. And yeah, that's at least that's what I remember. I hope I'm saying that sure. right. But yeah, um, so yeah, it's very very dangerous to not be able to trust your instruments to guide you. Yeah, so apparently, I think the phrase is flying blind, and he, mm. uh, which I'm sure is now outdated. Yeah, and yeah, not the best phrase, but. But uh, but yeah, in another way, he could have hit an aircraft that was not prepared for him to be there. Um, he actually, the officials were considering prosecuting him for that. So, <gasps> um, but oh all three gosh. times, Fred just got warnings. Wow. And Fred is somehow still eligible to get his commercial license or to at least try for it. Um, even after all that, 
like near prosecution and three incidents in the first tenth of your flying time. <sighs> also, he failed. There was one time where he failed three of his courses all at once, and then there were another two times where he failed all five of his classes at once. Oh, buddy, I'm just like my guy. It's you <laughs> take a nap. You're Do a s- Gemini. You're allowed to pick a different hobby. You know. Yeah, or at least move a little slower. Maybe that maybe you're overwhelming yourself. Great you point. Know? It seems like he's putting a lot of pressure on himself. Yeah, and it's just not working. Mm-hmm. So a year later, it is October 21st, and it's 1978. He's 20 years old. Mm-hmm. Um, this is when he has about 150 hours, a.k.a. three incidents under his belt. Mm-hmm. And he decides he's going to do a 90-minute flight to King Island. Um, not King's Island, by the way. Oh, which is... I was like, oh, I've been there. <laughs> no, um, King, which King actually I did fly. This is not a lie and not a joke. I flew what? an airplane over King's Island one time. I'm How serious. do you mean? Are you talking about like, is it one of the rides where you sit in a plane? <laughs> no, I literally flew an airplane. No, you did not. Were I you did. four and the pilot said you were flying? <laughs> I don't think the pilot lets you in the cockpit during the flight as a child. Um, <laughs> was it a real flight or do you mean like a remote control airplane? No, though? a real airplane. My stepdad in high school for my graduation or something for my 18th birthday got me uh, flight lessons. And I, did you not know this? <laughs> and I like flew a plane. I think I, I think I, I how much of the flying the plane did you well, do? Well, I mean, obviously there was like an instructor in the plane with me, but I was did up, you like flying the plane. Did part of you want to be a pilot for a while? Like not even, the... not even remotely. And I, he just be honest, a, a dad. He's he was just... just being a dad. And I was like, I'm gonna, in, I'm gonna try my best to enjoy this. Did not really enjoy a second of it. Was like, this is terrifying. I have no interest. And I loved John Denver at the time. I was like, I know how, I know what happened to that guy. I'm not, I'm not sure about this. Not what my a... favorite. I also went skydiving. Not something I want to do again. Um, also, I'd be so distracted. If I flew over my hometown amusement park, I would be like, oh, my God, look at all these things. And then the whole plane would just start spinning around yeah, yeah, in circles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why I think it was like a driver's ed car where he also had the controls and made me feel uh-huh. like I was in control when really I was just like pressing one button that probably didn't do anything. Um, but we did get to see Kings Island from up there. So anyway. Did Kings Island also have an Eiffel Tower? Yes. 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 I would be. It would be. If I were in a plane flying over King's Dominion <laughs> slash King's Island, it would be Tina Belcher driving in that parking lot where <laughs> <She's> <laughs> there's like only one. Driving directly to the pole or whatever. Was it a car or a pole? There's only, I, I think it was a car, but there's only, there's no, uh, there's nothing you could it's hit. All no empty obstacles. space. Except that one car, and that would be me with the fucking Eiffel Tower, at King's like, Dominion. Rrr. I would just be like, "Look at, oh my gosh, crash!" And then she's going, "Uh," <laughs> flying directly toward it. <laughs> yeah, he. I feel like I probably told the guy I want. Well, anyway, so I took, um, I took. Uh, I have a photo, and I have a framed like certificate of flight. Uh, oh, you know. So anyway, that I just when you said that, I was like. This is too good of an opportunity. I have to tell M that I actually literally flew a plane over Kings Island one time. That actually is you could. Uh, it's a weird the fun sentence, fact. The sentence alone, without all the information, I was like, that is truly like, a lie. <laughs> yeah, it's like if we were playing like like two truths and a lie, I'd be like, well, obviously that's, that's a lie. <laughs> that's the lie, right? I also got a certificate for um, being an aeronaut in training, which is the phrase for someone who operates air balloons, hot air balloons. Whoa! But it, I think it was like it was literally like like it might as well have had a teddy bear in the corner well of the i was gonna say especially if they say in trading like what does that really mean it's like, like not <laughs> everyone training. is an aeronaut in training i guess technically yeah um, uh that's cool I, my mom and i did a hot air balloon i've which, never done a hot air balloon i don't think i, I want to after all these honestly sky i don't recommend it. yeah I i'm think, not into it i will tell you any if you've ever seen it on television and you think it's romantic that's because there's music playing over it and, and you so can't hear loud. the sound it's yeah. so loud you're not enjoying talking there's to each a big other. fire next to your head it, every 10 seconds it goes like the worst like <sighs> wow yeah that's what and I've there's heard. a random person in the basket with you like you're not getting as romantic as you think you are you and your mom airplane. were not getting as romantic as you'd hoped i know <laughs> i 
no. And the way that you stop in a hot air balloon is literally, it yeah. just comes crashing down. You kind of just and have to like angle like, it. We, right. <laughs> like we, we half fell out of the basket on the way down. Oh my gosh. It just I hit per- the ground the wrong way and we just tipped out. <laughs> I just see M rolling ar- across the grass and the guy like trying to hand you your aeronaut in training certificate and you're just like rolling out of the hot air Homie, balloon. <laughs> It was in a field of cactuses. Oh, no. like, like, you tell me, like, there was nothing scarier than being, the only thing protecting you is wicker at 60 what miles an hour. What in the world? What in yeah. the world? Okay. It was a weird time. Okay, I'm glad anyway. we both had these ridiculous air experiences. Um, so this is why when I'm hearing about Fred, I'm like, Fred, this is not the hobby for you. It wasn't the hobby for me. It wasn't the hobby for M. It wasn't the career path for you, I think. Maybe he could have gotten into hot air ballooning or working at an amusement park. And either way, he would have maybe had some more success. I don't, there's a lot of danger in all of those fields. I feel like maybe he okay, needed maybe to just do something ground-based where you uh-huh. don't go way high in the sky, you know? He should have been, I don't know, a librarian. I'm trying to think of someone who just sits. Like Somebody just, who By sits. the way, I know librarians yeah. don't just sit. But <laughs> yes, before was, we get the librarians. I was I'm trying uh, to think of a trope that he could successfully oh, a do. We just sit. Oh my god, we just sit. Duh. Okay. A friend? Librarians have too much work on their hands. They I know. have to put books places. We just sit. Uh, amen. Amen. Uh I'll okay, so anyway, he has three he's gotten three warnings. He's failed all of his classes and now he's taking this 90 minute flight to a place that sounds a lot like King's Island, King Island. Got it. Um and he is again he only recently hit his 150 hours he's super new probably nervous um especially Mm. considering how poorly he's been doing he's probably like i don't want to fuck this up but i also need my hours um and the whole flight even though it's a 90 minute flight if you're doing round trip it's three hours sure okay um and the fuel endurance for his plane which is basically the gas tank Mm -hmm. um he had five hours worth of fuel Hmm. so five hours of fuel for a three-hour trip so he could have been in theory he was able to do the trip with plenty of fuel to get back right um so he rents this little uh single engine plane for those in the plane world it's called a cessna 182l Hmm. all right and uh he files a flight report with i don't know how to pronounce this but the mu rabin airport and his he gives them the registration uh his registration name and everything and relevant for later part of his registration uh was uh Delta Sierra Juliet which is what he was referring to himself on on the transmission he was calling himself Delta he was Sierra like, Juliet I'm a Delta pilot and they're like no you're not actually that <laughs> You can't say that. <laughs> like you should call yourself Spirit. <laughs> um, but so he identifies himself. <laughs> Sorry, that took me a second. Good, good one. <laughs> uh, he sh- he identifies himself to air traffic control as Delta Sierra Juliet, and it's based off of his registration. Okay. Um. So Fred seems to have told different people about different reasons for why he was going to King Island. Um. He apparently told some people that he was picking up friends. Uh, which hmm. he, I, I don't know if you can do that as a private pilot with that little hours. I don't know if there's rules to that, but I don't either. I mean, he was openly saying it to people, so I guess you could. Um, and he did actually take four, um, life jackets with him. So okay. maybe he was actually picking up friends. Um, and then for other people, I'm sorry, he told, we have a visitor. <laughs> is it little Geo? Come here. No. Is it well, Leona? yes. Come here. Is it everyone? Did you climb all the stairs? Oh my goodness. Can you pass her to me? I want to see the baby. Hi. Hi, pumpkin. Look at those little cheekies. Do you hi. see Uncle Lam? Can you say oui. hi? Smile. Hi. She smile. looks, she's like, I truly was so happy until this moment. <laughs> ah, there's a smile. Good girl. Look oh at her my. little pushy. Oh, she's so sweet. Hang on, I, like I want to show you her. Um, I want to show you her outfit. It says "wicked cute," Look and also her... she just went and got a bunch of shots. So I think oh. Blaze wanted to, her to come say hi and get a little, get a little hug, a little snug. Did she do okay? Hi, cutie. How many shots? Four. Oh my I'm sorry, goodness! Baby. 
One for each limb. Oh, oh, ah! oh no. Okay, 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 okay. You go see Daddy now. Bye bye. I love you. Pumpkin head. She's so sweet. She is a little pumpkin. She's a big pumpkin head. I know. I love I... you. Bye bye. I know, honey. You go play with Daddy. What's it going to be like when she can speak and then she's and can walk and she's running up every second that Honestly, we're recording? I am, I not thought about it until this very moment because she's learning to climb stairs. And of course, we stand behind her, you know, as she does it. But um, she just went from the first floor all the way up here to the third. Uh, so that shows some determination. Speaking of determination and some I chutzpah. Ho- I hope she's appreciative of that. <sighs> perfectly beating heart because me climbing through the stairs <laughs> it's a lot absolutely not yeah but if she's dedicated enough to crawl up those stairs by the time she can run up them i think we're all screwed so <laughs> anyway time for some gates i think some baby gates <laughs> oh yeah we've got them uh it's no match for for a leona it's, okay well good, good luck to you <laughs> well to be fair they're at the top of the stairs so that she doesn't tumble downward they're not really uh. made to keep her from going up the, st- you know what I mean. Anyway, oh, I no, I didn't know that. I just thought they I, I were probably should install them at the bottom as well. Um, well, I'll work on it. Maybe like a like a doggy gate or something. Yeah, <laughs> doggy yeah. gate downstairs, baby gate upstairs. Oh Lord. Um, where are we anymore? Oh, 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 oh. Um, okay, so he files a flight report and he's telling people different reasons why he even went he told some people he was going to pick up friends he told other people he was just going to go get crayfish oh which like wait okay. maybe those were his friends oh <laughs> <laughs> he's going to bikini bottom <laughs> he's um, gonna go pick up some friends that's what i call chicken wings like you know you're like oh i'm gonna go pick up some friends oh i met my kfc order but you know yeah, interchangeable. Yeah. i'm going to starbucks to see my buddies and my buddies are <laughs> cake pops <laughs> Yeah. So whatever the reason, uh, even though Fred filed a flight report, apparently he did it wrong or it didn't go through or something. Wow, it, I'm shocked. I know. And so King Island had no idea he was coming. <gasps> um, since they weren't expecting him, there were no lights on at the airport to oh, guide no. his landing. Oh, no. Oh, no. I will say, luckily, this doesn't end in a crash. Okay. How I know. Where are we going with this? What the hell? So we do know that uh, King Island did not know he was coming. Also, I will say, fun fact, in um, King Island, it's between mainland Australia and Tasmania, and it's mm-hmm. in an area called the Bass Strait or the Bass Strait Triangle. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's called the Bass Strait Triangle sometimes because it is often compared to the Bermuda Triangle. No way. Okay. Uh-oh. So That's there fine. are several disappearances several shipwrecks oh, and a lot shit. of times people just kind of blame like uh, like weather conditions um for the vanishings but king island alone had 60 shipwrecks you got to cover the bermuda triangle someday i know but it's so overwhelming it's yeah so, i bet it's that's that's like might be a two-parter with yeah. the amount of information out there um but yes you're right i do need to cover it um be fun and king island has at least 60 shipwrecks with like over 2000 people missing or around 2000 people missing. So Holy um, Lord. So he's flying right over this area. Great. And, <laughs> and nobody knows he's coming. Perfect. Right. Right. So at 6:19 p.m., Fred takes off and he has only very recently been approved for night flying, like Great. within the last 4 months. And probably begrudgingly. Mhm. Yeah, everyone's like, oh, "I Fine. guess Fred can do it." <laughs> and the airport um I guess they understood that he they said he was seemed nervous before takeoff, but that was understandable because he was so new to night flying. Um, and fun fact, I will say that at different times before this incident, Fred's dad tells us that um, Fred often worried about what would happen. Because remember, he's a UFO th- enthusiast. Oh. He often worried about what would happen if a UFO attacked him mid-flight. Which like... <laughs> Like so if just, you're gonna be a pilot, that's not the, and you keep failing the tests. Maybe worry about something different. I feel like 
It is a thought I'd have, but it wouldn't be a thought I was voicing often. Exactly. I feel like if I keep failing the test and I'm like just trying to be cut, like maybe put that on the back burner for now. You know, like first you have to get in the air. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. First you have to have a successful learn how to take off before you worry about how you're going to get abducted. Okay, got it. But I will say it's interesting that that was like always one of his biggest fears. And interesting because then... I feel like that's where this is maybe going. Mm hmm. Uh, so 40 minutes into his flight at 7 p.m., he reports being over Cape Ottawa, which is exactly what was planned. So, so far his, his flight plan is, is going accordingly. Okay. Um, and that's 40 minutes into the flight. And it also says that he's at 5,000 feet altitude, which as we know, planes can go well over 30,000 feet. So he's right. not too high in the air or anything. He's pretty, pretty low. Um, and six minutes later... He calls about the about there being a problem Uh-oh. only six minutes later. So it was going super smoothly. And then six minutes later, he reaches out. This is part of the accident report by the Australian Department of Transport. Um, Fred says, Melbourne, this is Delta Sierra Juliet. Is there any known traffic below 5,000? And they say no known traffic. <gasps> and then Fred says, well, there's an aircraft flying below him. And Uh-oh. they ask what type of aircraft. And he says he can't identify it, but he saw four bright landing lights on it. And within seconds, it had climbed over him over a thousand feet. Whoa, whoa. So now he's he's still reaching out to them. And they ask him again to identify the aircraft. But Fred says it was traveling so fast he couldn't see anything. And asks again if there are any military aircraft nearby. And they say no. Oh, my gosh. Apparently, the aircraft is coming up to Fred from the east, and it's now approaching him. And Fred says, it seems to me that he's playing some sort of game. He's <gasps> flying over me three times at speeds I cannot identify. Um, and then Fred restates that he's at only 4,500 feet, and he still couldn't see what this uh, object actually was. Mm. He's told to stand by, but then Fred calls in soon after. It's not an aircraft. <gasps> Ooh, goose cam. He does try to describe it and says it was a long shape. So maybe like the Tic Tac incident, like mm-hmm. uh, like how it's like a uh, oblong. Mm-hmm. But other than that, Fred says that it was moving too fast for him to see anything else. But he did notice a green light um, that was coming from it and that it seemed metallic on all sides. Okay. Oh, boy. Then it vanishes. And Fred asks if... It could possibly be military, even though they've already said no. Um, After it's vanished, he's like, are you sure it couldn't have been military? Then it reappears. Mm. And then traffic control reaches out to him. I think they're all of a sudden like worried that he might be up to no good or something or either pulling a prank or maybe if it is or if it is military and they're not allowed to say anything about that. Maybe the military aircraft is after him. Right. They they don't know what's going on. So traffic control reaches out and asks Fred, what are your intentions? oh they're like are, like i guess asking like are you a threat like i don't what like, what's are your going intentions on? with my daughter i mean aircraft uh, with <laughs> with our shiny tic tac <laughs> um and fred says my intentions uh to go to king island uh melbourne that aircraft is hovering on top of me again it's hovering it's not an aircraft <gasps> Then I guess it's silent for too long. And so traffic traffic control reaches out again and says Delta Sierra Juliet. And Fred says Delta Sierra Juliet Melbourne. And then 17 seconds of silence with his mic on. (gasps) They call for him again, but Fred doesn't answer and they can only hear loud metallic noise and then radio silence. I remember the metallic scraping. Scraping. Uh, It's almost as if it collided into him. Well, have you heard it? Mm-mm. it's not it's like this it's the creepiest sound you need to play it they played it on astonishing legends you need to play it maybe we can play it on here too yeah let me um, look it up it's 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 so unsettling it's very tinny Yeah, I, it's, it just sounds to me like something's rubbing against it, or like, or like uh, pulsing, or some people think that you can hear like a talking quality within it, like he's trying to talk oh. through it, um, but that 
like one some people think that it's like electromagnetic interference that's like distorting it so you you can't like really hear the radio signal but like there's this kind of background noise like he's trying to but it's all scrambled mm. um just very spooky um because it's not like a crash sound it's just like this long drawn out like metallic tinny noise it does sound almost like um like a broken phone and you're trying to talk through yeah. it but you just hear uh like like feedback or something yeah yeah, yeah. i think that's what it is too that's definitely good that's a good theory i hadn't thought about that well someone on reddit said it so <laughs> oh no it definitely does sound like like you're talking it's like your phone fell underwater and yeah you're it's trying like to distorted talk. Yeah, yeah, yeah 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 um but anyway so the whole interaction is about six minutes long Ugh. and that was and six minutes ago it was totally fine his like flight plan was going right and then this happens oh, wow so at seven twelve, uh traffic control sends out an alert and by seven thirty three when fred has not actually landed at king island yet like he should have um they declare a distress phase and mm. officials begin and see air sea and land searches wow um the search lasted four days but they never found fred and despite being a bad pilot they did take it seriously they looked into the weather conditions of what was sure, going on around him and everything was totally fine and the accident report even called the condition the weather conditions excellent visibility and light winds and the sun hadn't even set yet so oh he, wow so it wasn't like it was super duper dark My so God. um the next few days which is super interesting is that uh as people were talking about where the fuck fred went 11 different people called in and reported ufo sightings the same night fred vanished oh i just got goose cam um the australian department of transport there's a spokesman named ken williams and he says it's funny all these people ringing up with ufo reports well after his disappearance it seems often people decide after the event that they too had seen strange lights but although we can't take them too seriously we can never discourage such reports while investigating a plane's disappearance so He's mm. saying like, oh, that's convenient, but also I guess we'll take it into account. Yeah, I would think you should. I mean, whether you believe in it or not, like if people are saying, I saw something really weird, like it's yeah. worth writing down. I don't know. I think so. In another news report, they also stated that a couple saw um, strange green lights hovering high above them at the same night um, when they were on the highway near Melbourne. So they saw green lights hovering See? above them. You know, uh, the lights also for them, this couple that reported it, they said that the lights were out there for an hour and King Island residents allegedly experienced strange lights for at least six weeks leading up to that night. <gasps> See, I'm listen, I believe it 100 percent. Oh, Fred, too, probably. Also, can you imagine if your biggest fear is aliens and that's yeah. how you go missing? And, you know, this is one of those things where I get into like my own head and i start thinking about it too probably way too much but you know it makes me wonder like is that be like is that just a precursor like is that a coincidence or is there some part of him that like knew mm -hmm. he would have some sort of encounter you know how some people are some families just seem to have like um repeated encounters and it's almost like yeah they know that it's gonna happen again and again um i, I yeah. don't know may, maybe he had some incident when he was younger and that's why he was so fascinated maybe he knew there was going to be another encounter like who knows that's actually a really good point that like maybe something had already happened yeah and he maybe even subconsciously was like, just right. always thinking about it and he clearly had a insistence upon getting into the sky which listen, yeah we've tried to talk about it over and over again but <laughs> he wouldn't listen ruthless no uh <laughs> relentless relentless determined, determined. diligent chutzpah mm -hmm. moxie yeah, yeah moxie yeah. all of it <laughs> so uh the newspaper there called the australian actually used an anonymous tip as their source when writing about uh fred's disappearance that night and the anonymous source allegedly comes from the Department of Transport, saying that Fred's transmission uh, actually went longer than we think. Oh, my. But they cut it off uh, early and then released that to the public. To I, wanna, cover I up. want the whole thing. Well, according to the source, Fred just described the UFO in great detail. <gasps> but they cut the transmission early so that 
it wouldn't get released. Oh my goodness. I need to know what it says. The Department of Transport officially publicly denies that the source is accurate on, oh, they only released part of the transmission, which I'm just impressed that they've released any of the transmission. I feel like I've I feel like that doesn't happen too often. Yeah, but I feel like that's a great way to just be like, see, we released it. Oh, yep. I would have fought for it like that. (laughs) Because it's like, oh, well, they're not hiding anything, you know? But if they're like, we won't release the transcript, it's like, well, why, you know? Uh Uh-huh. Okay, yeah, totally right. I would have been bamboozled immediately. (laughs) (laughs) So uh, one of the theories as to what happened to Fred is that they think, this is so sad, they think it's because he was not that great of a pilot, he which like now feels a little victim blamey no it does i yeah i i want to clarify i was not joking about how f- funny this would be if something no, no, went no, no, wrong no. you know but they a lot of people think because he was uh not that great at being a pilot he might have gotten confused and inverted his plane aka flown upside down oh my god <laughs> which like, i feel like that seems like something you'd notice yeah uh but if he were flying upside down he could have mistaken his own lights in the water's reflection okay that's that's, i mean i know that happens but i feel like it's a stretch for somebody maybe for somebody who's literally never touched a plane before but like you literally flew a plane over king island oh no i know i'm saying for somebody to do that who's never touched a plane maybe possible but i feel like if you've been like me very experienced on with flying an aircraft um i feel like you'd notice if you were especially especially if it weren't dark yet let me point that out also like i don't know if if anyone's ever been upside down down, but after 30 seconds like you know you're hanging upside down you know something's wrong i would think blood is rushing to your face you can't even see right like you're i don't know but anyway so that's like the the running theory is that he was just so confused Seems like a stretch to me i know i know in 2013, the Skeptical Inquirer, uh, they had uh, astronomer and retired Air Force pilot James McGaha and a senior researcher, Joe Nickel, who Joe Nickel, I think, is actually pretty big in UFO mm. um, debunking. Um, but they also agree that he was probably confused. They think that uh, even though the, the flying conditions were clear skies, uh when it comes to the stars and the planets, Venus, Mars, Mercury, and the star called Antares were in a long diamond shape that night. And maybe Fred mistook those bright lights for an aircraft. Mm-hmm. And the green lights could have been this, this I feel like is most likely the green lights were his wing navigation light, just reflecting in the windshield, which listen, like, listen I've to the, done that people. Oh, wait, where you see a light and it's just a reflection. Of, yeah. Yeah. But listen, listen to the, you don't have to, but whoever, (laughs) just listen to the Astonishing Legends because they really do dive into every single theory and like pick it apart. And I feel like with this, especially with the planets and stuff, they're like, no, I mean, again, it wasn't dark yet. That's true. Right? No, I agree with you. And he said there was a metallic object. I think the, the best thing that, the only one I'm agreeing with so far is the, that it was in the reflection of his own windshield because but the I've whole time he done keeps that. calling and saying there's still this aircraft below me like it seems like such a bizarre oh yeah yep, yep, yep he yep, sees he an was... aircraft below him then he says now it's above me like what's going on i don't know yeah. it just seems weird to me that it would be like oops i saw a reflection for several minutes and like it was moving and i don't know mm. maybe maybe i don't know I guess I could see if you're flying a plane and like you turn a certain way and then like the light reflection is below you and then you turn and then it's above you. I'm trying. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. yeah, maybe. I, I don't know. I'm only saying it because I know I would be so stupid as to walk into Same. that problem. So, Same. Uh, but no, you're totally right to have seen something metallic to be also like, here's another big thing. It's moving so fast. He can't describe it, but like. Yeah. If it were a reflection, it'd be sitting in the exact same spot the entire it wouldn't, time. It would be, yeah, it would be like relational to you the whole time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, plus in the, in the weather conditions he was in, I didn't know this, but apparently it's a thing where the sunset can actually cause an illusion for pilots mm-hmm. that the horizon is tilted. Yeah. So people will try to correct by adjusting their wings to straighten the plane out with the horizon. But if the horizon is tilted, then they become tilted mm-hmm. and then they accidentally um, cause their plane to go into a downward spiral mm. causing call it called a graveyard spiral because yeah that's a real I had no thing. idea 
And that's no why you have to trust your instrumentation because your gut or your eyes will like mis mislead you. So they think that maybe he it was something as simple as oh the horizon made him want to adjust his wings because he you know he was just trying to keep with the horizon and then he ended up spiraling and crashing in the water mm. which that seems most likely currently i guess but wouldn't they have found him i guess so yeah i don't know um there's one pilot who doesn't buy any of those and says like the pilot would have absolutely known if he was upside down like yeah the- i'm glad somebody who's a pilot said that because i feel like yeah. i don't have the authority to say that but i feel like that's for sure true his name is Arthur Shutt. He even says, like, the carpet comes out of the floor and butts fall out of the ashtray. Like, Yeah, there you go. Oh, but uh, the ashtray. <laughs> they said the ashtray. Also, your butt <laughs> falls out of the seat. Like, no, yeah. I thought you said your butt falls out of the ashtray. Like, oh, the... maybe I did. Butt no, fall out of the ashtray. Like, no, but, like, what I'm saying is I thought you were calling the seat the ashtray. And I was like, oh. that's hysterical. <laughs> your butt's falling out of the ashtray. And then I was like, oh, the ashtray. But I got it, it. it is still true. Yeah, I liked it's still it, accurate. but but that's a great point. Like if you're upside down, like shit is, like stuff is falling from the floor. I also like that in a plane at that time there was an ashtray and you could of just course. smoke in your own little plane. I love that on some planes there are still ashtrays. You just can't smoke anymore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, wait. anyway, that um. So yeah, this there's an, a pilot out there being like that's fucking bullshit. Um. Also, Fred's dad really does believe there was a ufo there at night but i do understand there there's also a level of grieving there and maybe it's denial and maybe he just wants to believe it's something else besides you know a crash um but his dad says fred was a firm believer in ufos and now i think he was right what else can explain Mm. this mystery i have a very strong feeling that my son is still alive and is being held by someone from another (sighs) world they might want to they might want to hold him for a week or so before returning him, but I have no idea why they would want to take my son, but strange things do happen. And then believing that Fred was abducted, he even worried that if they were to drop him off, they would just drop him off anywhere on earth. Like not back to the exact point where they took him. They're and like, so it's started, all the same. <laughs> yeah. They're like, I don't know what a, I don't Whatever. know if any place is a place. And, uh, he started asking people all over the world to start looking out for Fred in case oh, he came geez. back to the wrong spot. Um, That's Fred, so sad. Fred also had a girlfriend, Rhonda, who believed that Fred, uh, she actually was like, I think he crashed. She was. <gasps> Wait, really? Yeah. She said Fred turned. She thinks Fred turned back after experiencing engine trouble and crashed in the water. Oh, no. Um, And she, uh, apparently. This is a quote from Rhonda. He always told me that's what he'd do if he got into trouble over the sea, is he would just crash the plane into the water. Okay. Oh, so no. I think she's like, that's why I... Th- I mean, that's I guess, why I th- yeah. Like, if he was having engine trouble, he'd just crash into the water, and that's what he said he'd do if he ever got in trouble Why would water. he do so, that? I don't know, but it's at oh. least she's like... She's like, a, he told me that's what he would do. Okay. So. Oh or my. maybe he, or maybe that he was turning back at all and then just happened to crash into the water. Right, right, right. Um, she also said that this is just like a a weird I guess I've talked about it in conversation as like like as a joke in relationships that if a, a UFO ever came to Earth, he would go with them, but he would take her with him. And so oh, I'd be like, no, thanks. <laughs> yeah. So she, I guess uh, she was like, hey, if if a UFO did go, it did show up, at least he always told me he'd go with them anyway. So I know um, but she's like, he left me behind. Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't know if he, how much of a say he gets with the UFO to be like, can we halt all this real quick we got to get back and pick someone else we got to swing we got to make a pit stop real quick <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh fred's friends went out um and they started looking for him in the plane but they found nothing and rumors began that this was all a hoax and he faked his own disappearance um like i said his father truly thinks that there are aliens at play yeah and a month after fred vanished another pilot thought that he actually saw a submerged aircraft in the same area but couldn't actually confirm what he saw but then nothing ever came from it wow um and later a guy who was at the bass strait that that area um the same day of the abduction potential abduction uh, he took several photos around the time that Fred vanished. And one of the photos he got, actually, there is like a blur in the sky that looks like it could be a flying object at sunset. Oh, my. Um, it could also be like a bird or a bug sure. or dirt. Um, but I have 
um oh, that you have picture. It? Ooh. Yeah. It could be anything, but it is interesting that he got this right around the same time that Fred was said to be abducted. Ooh. Um and then it almost one of, looks like a parachute to me. I don't know what it looks like to me. It's weird. I think it could just be like a like a spot on the photo. Like just like I a I guess. It's I don't know. Big spot. I don't know what it is. We it doesn't look like anything I've seen. No. Yeah. Um, years later, another person came forward and they actually said they were driving home the same night and saw Fred's plane flying, which is, oh. they were able to tell which plane it was because they identified the plane by its registration number. Oh, and wow. They confirmed they also saw strange green lights that flew just above Fred's plane, but they what? never made an official report because they got ridiculed by their friends when they were talking about it. See? So if this story is true, then that guy actually witnessed Fred's abduction and can confirm it was a UFO that took Holy him Holy Lord. Anyway, that is Fred Valentich. That is that, quite a that tale. That is the abridged version, which uh, I would I would love to do m- more research and be like astonishing legends quality. But also, well, I don't know have... if people want um, six no, days of me talking they about go, it. They go to that for that and this for this, you know? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. But yeah, they did. Um, they did. It was at least a three parter. So yeah, I feel like if you uh, see a topic on Astonishing Legends, come here first and hear the the sample. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And then if you like what you hear, go and get and like, then the hear full me in depth investigation, like butchering what they're saying, and then go listen to them and be like, oh, that's what Christine meant. <laughs> they, yeah, <you're>, she's <laughs> trying to quote them. It's not really what they said. So yeah, they did a three part episode, um, which all are marked as played on my podcast player. Um, but yeah, they're, and they, they interview people like they go through, but they also have like an entire, uh, it's called the arc, the astonishing research core. So they have like a whole group of people who are oftentimes like professional researchers who, who do all this research and stuff for a living, um, mm-hmm. and help them, uh, help them prepare for episodes. So we, we don't have an arc, you know, but, uh, if you do want to listen to the whole thing, they did a, cr- I mean, it's creepy so creepy um and then they go through all the theories and stuff so good job em that was fun um thank you what a tale what a tale i mean it's very sad you know no matter what yeah i mean it's either it's a crash or a vanishing or a wreck somewhere and because it's i mean it's known as like a bermuda triangle like maybe he really just got lost and then there's the fear of like oh maybe he's just suffering somewhere and we don't know where he is yeah i mean it's just too bad because people lost him you know Mm -hmm. yeah and don't know where he went well i have a true crime tale for you today em believe it or not i do believe it a little bit yeah great this is the story of amanda stavik or mandy stavik okay so i don't know her we're starting where we always start amanda Teresa stavik who went by mandy was born in april of 1971 She lived in Alaska until the seventh grade with her mom, Mary, and her three siblings. She had a sister named Molly, a brother named Lee, and a brother named Brent. Okay. So Brent, who was 17 years old, had permission to hunt in the woods on a nearby military base. But horribly, in 1975, he was found dead with 17 bullet wounds to his head and chest. Holy shit. Yeah, from a twenty-two rifle. Um, You weren't. You didn't waste any time today. Didn't I just jump right in, you know? You know how I do. Yeah. Um, there was an investigation, but no one was ever named or brought to justice. So this was just this unsolved, horrific murder mm. of of uh, Mandy's brother. Mary, the mom, uh, who was divorced, moved her three surviving children to a small town in rural Whatcom County, Washington, called Acme, which Ooh. doesn't that sound like a looney tunes like anvil you know like an acme <laughs> anvil like yeah. they moved to a small town called acme like it doesn't even sound like a real place but it is so they moved to acme uh so it's the northernmost county in washington and it borders canada uh and the pacific ocean okay so they lived on seven and a half acres of quiet land on a, a road called strand road and it was a dead end off highway nine they didn't have many neighbors and it, again this being a small town they knew all their neighbors Mary Stavik herself was a school bus driver, was very well known in the community. And Mandy, 
uh, was a popular, much-loved student. She went to Mount Baker High School. She did marching band. She did several sports. Her family and friends uh, said she loved ev- anything athletic, all things athletic. She rode horses bareback. She played softball, track, and basketball. Uh, her mom told her she couldn't do so many hobbies at the t- same time, and Mandy said, you want to bet? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hey, talk about Moxie. I know, I know. And her mom said, you never bet with Mandy. She always wins. So mm. clearly she um, was a force to be reckoned with. So the Stavics used to borrow cows from a nearby farmer in the summer to mow their properties to like eat the grass, which is... I love that they're doing old school mowing. That's right. Pretty genius. And feeding the cattle at the same time. Love it. Mowing and mooing. <laughs> That's what I always say. And uh, when man, this is just an example of like her moxie. Uh, when she was two years old, she ran under a fence to try to play with a bull in their yard. And Mandy's oh. mom said it was her favorite memory of her adventurous daughter because she was like, oh, my God, these bulls are going to kill my child. And instead, she marched on in there and the bulls were like afraid of her and stood down. I feel like that's some Leona shit. I feel yeah, like. I know. I, I read that and I was like, oh, no. Oh, no. Now I have to avoid cows, too. Like this yeah. child. Just bulls. Just, just angry bulls. bulls. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, and her mom said she was not afraid to do anything that she set out to do. So she had a boyfriend. Uh, his name was Rick Zender. And he described Mandy as his first great love. Um, he felt way below her league and couldn't believe she loved him back. Um, and they had that kind of classic high school relationship where they broke up a couple times, got back together, but it was all pretty lighthearted high school stuff. And um, they actually got together before Mandy graduated and headed to college at Central Washington University, where she made uh, really good friends with her roommate, Yoko, who was studying abroad from Japan, um, was having a great time as a freshman in college. And in 1989, uh, she was a college freshman and she came home for Thanksgiving break and brought her friend Yoko with her to hmm. to uh, to her hometown, which is kind of fun because the, the roommates from Japan, you know, so she's like, oh, th- Thanksgiving, you can come to my house. I just think that's nice. really sweet. Yeah, that is sweet. So the day after Thanksgiving, Mandy and Yoko had plans to meet up with friends in Bellingham, Washington. Mm-hmm. But in all the holiday craziness, Mandy was like, I want to go for a jog. I want to fit it, squeeze it in before we have all our holiday plans. And for years, she had the same route in their neighborhood. She would drive, uh, not drive, I would drive. She would run from her house several miles down Strand Road to Nooksack River and back. And okay. she would always bring along her German shepherd, Kyra. Uh, normally, her mom would follow along on a bicycle and just kind of like, follow behind and do her exercise via bike but uh because there was so much holiday craziness going on they had family visiting uh her mom decided to stay home and sent um mandy and kyra on their way okay of course tragically mary to this day says she still kicks herself for letting mandy go on this run alone that day Mm. of course not man not mary's fault but i imagine it must be one of those moments those pivotal moments of like i should have agreed to go you know even though i was busy um mandy was known to listen to music on a walkman as she jogged uh neighbors saw her going one way saw her going the other way and her own brother lee who was visiting a neighbor even saw his sister jog by while he was at his friend's house oh Um, okay and this was only a quarter mile from their house, and they believe he might be the last person to have seen her. <gasps> oh, shit. Yeah. Well, enter trauma. Okay. Enter trauma. Mandy, of course, did not make it home on time, and Mary began to get nervous, especially when Kyra, the dog, showed up on the front porch alone. Forget it. I, my stomach would have dropped. Stomach. It's, yeah, 100%. And of course, Kyra, the dog, is nervous. She's pacing. She's freaked out, and it's just so scary and sad um mary of course knew something was wrong right away it called mandy's boyfriend rick to see if like he knew where she was um pretty immediately people in the neighborhood jumped into action because this was just so unusual and they they knew her they knew mandy they knew she went on these daily jogs it just was so bizarre that she wouldn't have made it home uh they thought maybe she had twisted her ankle uh in the woods and so uh couldn't make it home and sent the dog home to you know, send for help, basically. Um, So they searched the area, hoping they would find her either along the roads or stuck somewhere. 
Um, but a search produced pretty much nothing. Um, <gasps> just nothing. It just vanished. So Mandy's family called the police and detectives jumped on the case immediately. Um, remember, this is also a small town. So this is like yeah. unheard of, something like this. Investigators remember that the anxiety increased and increased as the search continued with nothing to show. Mary called her other daughter, Molly, who said, this can't be happening to us again. Because yeah, if you remember, well, yeah. Because their, their son slash brother already died. Guess what? what? So did the other one. What? The other brother also Lee? died. Yeah, so... She, the sister, was haunted by the death of their brother Brent in Alaska and their stepbrother, who'd also died in Alaska in a boating accident only the year before. Oh. So this is, like, the third child tragedy to, to happen in this family. What? I know. How can that keep happening? I know. I know. It's horrific. It's like some people just get beat down and beat down and beat down. Jesus. Oh, my God. And so Mary said to her daughter, yeah. of course it can't happen. We're going to find her and it'll be okay. But she didn't believe it. Uh, she had already. I wouldn't, yeah, yeah. I would be like just trying to calm everyone around exactly. me. Exactly. That's basically what she was doing. Yeah. She was basically just trying to give Molly hope, even though she had already lost a child mysteriously, the mm -hmm. murder with no answers and knew what it was like to live without answers. So it was already kind of preparing for the worst. Yeah. So reporters quickly jumped on the f case. Mandy's face was everywhere. Um, you know, it's high school girl gone missing. It's just, you know, one of those stories that catch like wildfire. Police investigated Mandy's boyfriend, Rick. They questioned him several times, but he just was not ruled as a suspect. They ruled him out pretty quickly. Mm. A full-blown search went into effect and investigators used every resource they could get their hands on. They had border patrol helicopters, boats, bloodhounds, specialized trackers. They searched the woods, the fields, ditches. Essentially, the entire community got involved in this search. Yeah. So one tracker found Mandy's tracks and a spot where her tracks and her dog's tracks seemed to stop randomly. Oh. Uh, he thought maybe somebody at this point had pulled her into a vehicle, which is why her tracks yeah. stopped. That's what I would think. Yeah, and so the thought uh, kind of branching off of that was perhaps this uh, would have taken several abductors, but there because there was no sign of a struggle, there, but there was also no sign of multiple people being around her tracks. Um, he tried to walk the German Shepherd, Kyra, back down the route, but poor baby, poor Kyra mm. was so stressed about walking down this route, even though she went daily on this jog every single day she she's refused yeah she's traumatized she refused to walk down the path um and investigators uh believed that the abductor had probably either kicked or hurt her during the during oh. the struggle while she was trying to of course protect mandy which yeah. oh it breaks my heart so enough neighbors and Mandy's brother had seen her, like I said, right before her disappearance. So they knew like pretty much the exact time she must have been taken because they saw her like a quarter mile from her house. Um, but they were coming up empty handed on everything else. And like mm. I said, Acme was this super tr classic small town. Um, the peace in the town was completely shattered by this disappearance. And Mandy's stepsister, Bridget, said... It could have been anyone, and everywhere we went could be the person who did this to Mandy. Everywhere I looked, there was Ugh. danger. So it's just like you don't know who to trust. I've heard that from a few victims that were like, they just don't get answers. Like every single person. It's like, yes. were you involved? Were you involved? Were you, you know, involved? speaking of like the Fred Valentich and, and all that too, it's sort of that feeling as a family member. I imagine it's that feeling of like you can if you don't know whether they're they've passed or not you could probably like see them in people as you walk past like you know i imagine you're still looking for that person yeah. um so that must be just oh, constant God. hyper vigilance so you on never really sides. get to grieve you're just yeah always... you never have that rest uh it's mm. just tragic so three days after she had gone missing it was monday firefighters unfortunately found mandy's body uh while searching the nooksack river by boat she was in the water yes yes her body was about six miles from home it had been caught in some debris in a south fork of the river she only had shoes and socks on uh and they initially id'd her based on the sneakers that her mom described that she had been wearing uh on the day she went missing 
The water was knee deep and it was so cold that her body was really well preserved. And to the point where one investigator on the scene said it looked like if you shook her, she would wake up like she was only sleeping. Oh, just horrible, horrible. Also, okay, so that that gives me a bit of a note, though, that like the person who did this didn't think about how well preserved her body would be in that kind of water. Like, I feel like does that help for autopsies and things like that to be able to um or to, like crime scene maybe i think perhaps i think just being in the water also makes it hard um oh right whether it's okay. preserved or not okay just because like uh the water does so much damage but they did they were i mean they were able to um get some intel so may- maybe it was because it was well preserved um okay. like they were able to see that uh her body didn't really have much trauma to it at all. Um, there were scratches from the blackberry bushes. Like she'd run th- straight through some really like sharp branches. Mm. Uh, and that's pretty much all they could tell. And so there really wasn't much to, to glean from this. But Mandy's boyfriend, Rick, was at Mandy's house at the Stavik house when investigators knocked on the door to tell Mary that they that they found uh, her daughter's body. And she said she knew all along that Mandy would be found dead, even though she didn't want to admit it to herself. Mm -hmm. There's this 2020 episode um, that I watched that interviews her um, and her boyfriend, Rick as well. Uh, Not Mary's, I'm sorry, Mandy's boyfriend, Rick and interviews Mary. And Mary said, I knew, I knew she was gone. I don't know why. I think mothers know. I've talked to other mothers who felt the same thing. I knew she was dead. I didn't want to say it even to myself, but I knew. Which is Mm. interesting in contrast to Fred's dad who said, I just know he's alive somewhere, which is an interesting like twist on that, you know? That's That's actually a great point. I don't know. Makes me wonder. Maybe, I don't know. Maybe I don't know what that that means or what that doesn't mean. Yep, me neither. (laughs) <laughs> that's Great. the moral of this podcast i don't know what that means or doesn't mean me neither the end <laughs> go find astonishing legends yeah, episode they, on it Maybe they know more about answer. everything it seems <laughs> so she also said um in this she also said in an interview there's nothing worse than losing a child and i already knew that because she had already lost a child and then a stepchild i mean it's just like nonstop grief mm. so molly the sister remembers running out of the house and screaming in a field uh, just at life, at God, for being so unfair to her family. I, I can't imagine. No. I can't, I can't imagine. So in the autopsy, um, they were actually able to gather a little more evidence of what happened. Um, they ruled drowning as the cause of death at first, but it didn't seem to make much sense because Mandy, remember how sporty she was? She was a very strong swimmer. Um, And she was found in pretty shallow water, so it didn't really make sense that she would have died by drowning. Mm -hmm. Um, Beyond that, it was December, and she was out for a run. Why would she go uh, swimming? Like, It just didn't make much sense. The only clue that really added to this was a hematoma, which was uh, bleeding under her scalp that wasn't visible until the autopsy. And it was about uh, three by two inches, this bruise. And uh, the injury wasn't enough to kill her, but it might have knocked her out. And then being unconscious and thrown into the water could have been the cause of death. She could have drowned. Obviously, um, you know, being unconscious wouldn't have been able to make her way out. The examiner also determined that she had been raped. So they were able to um, to determine that there was DNA inside of her, uh, which some investigators in 1989 might not have considered because DNA evidence was still in its infancy, science-wise. Sure. But because the FBI was involved in this case, they made sure to collect. They knew they knew this was kind of an up-and-coming thing. They knew to collect the DNA, thank God. Uh, meanwhile, at Mount Baker High School, they hosted a memorial service in the auditorium, and more than 1,000 people attended. Uh, it was standing room only. And uh, the Stavik family then separately held a private graveside funeral uh, at the burial. The community was just like, I mean, rocked by this. Uh, They felt like their innocence had been stolen um, because, you know, being in this memorial, it's like there's a thousand people here. And once again, like any of these people could have had something to do with it, could know something like who we know everybody. And like in the small towns, like we know everybody, but somebody's hiding something, you know, it's just very scary thought. I I feel like my first thought, I mean, I would have. I can't imagine the 
the violating feeling of a whole town because it's so small everyone knew each other or at least in the neighborhood mm-hmm. everyone knew each other but i i wonder if um uh i think my first thought would have been like oh it must have been someone just like driving through town because i i would still be i wouldn't be able to process that someone in right. our town could do it you know Right, right. It's almost like a protection thing. Like, well, I'm sure nobody I know did it. You know, you don't right. want to believe that. Um, hmm. Which is interesting that you say that because people were at a loss, no obvious suspects. And then it kind of came to everyone's attention that further south in Seattle, the Green River serial killer was at large. Oh. And his victims were all white women from their teens to their 30s, uh, whom he buried near the Green River. And Mandy fit the victim profile, but weirdly enough, was just too far north to really match the killer's MO. But didn't you um, say it was the holidays? It was Thanksgiving break, yes. So maybe he could have, it was someone who was out there for school and came home for the holidays or something? And Could was... be, could be. Some people definitely believe that was... Uh, that was who had done it. Um, there was actually like a whole task force looking into this and oh, okay. they compared Mandy's death uh, with the Green River Killer MO and they just decided this is just too unlikely to fit the mm-hmm. bill. Just doesn't make sense. Um, and so they kind of left that lead behind. Uh, for what it's worth, Mary, uh, Mandy's mother, worked with the media. She was, I mean, it sounds exhausting and difficult, but she kept doing interviews, kept doing talk shows. Like she just wanted the story to remain at the top of people's minds. She wanted anybody with information to come forward. And uh, meanwhile, detectives established a tip line, which was getting a huge amount of calls every day. And even though investigators followed up on hundreds of leads, they just went nowhere. Mm. So it was like the most frustrating thing for investigators and for Mandy's family. It felt like they just kept hitting dead ends no matter how many leads they would come across. So the FBI profilers who we love, well, especially as a fan of the show Mindhunter, (laughs) uh, the profilers did a little profile with their little magic and they determined the killer would be someone in Mandy's community. Oh, no. Not a stranger. That makes it so much worse. I know. An early suspect was a man named Paul, who was a nearby neighbor, and he was actually one of the last people to see Mandy alive. He described seeing a dark pickup truck drive past just after Mandy jogged by, and police felt like it was a red flag that he didn't notice the make and model of the car. Mm, where, I wouldn't. I wouldn't either. I mean, again, not to like constantly be comparing this to the Fred story, but like, the guy, the person driving around who saw the airplane was like, I recognize the registration number and the make and model of the airplane. I'm like, yeah. I wouldn't even know what kind of truck that was. I would, I'd be like, you're going to get a lot out of me if I know the color and yeah. if there was like a dent or and something how many in wheel, it. how many wheels it had. Any funny bumper stickers? I might notice that too. Yeah, but. I would notice the bumper stickers for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So essentially they felt like it was a red flag he didn't notice the make and model so they asked for his dna and he refused to give a sample and so police again were like "Mm, i don't like this yeah red flag so paul held his ground until investigators obtained his dna by court order uh and it was not a match so this just proves sometimes people with nothing to hide don't want to give their dna to police so you know what i mean it's not the only uh that's true It doesn't necessarily mean anything. Um, That's true. Again and again, suspects were ruled out when their DNA... And I I imagine also, back then, this was such a new concept to be collecting DNA. And I'm sure people... Some people were like, what are you doing? Like, I'm sure if you didn't know what that was for... Yeah. Oh, no. I I can certainly understand people being like, well, I don't know what they're doing with my DNA. Like, why would I want to give that to Like, I'm not going to voluntarily give that to you. Yeah, I can can absolutely understand that. There could even be people out there being like, oh, well, they're going to plant it somewhere. And then all of a sudden I like yeah, look guilty. You never know. Yeah. I mean, or it could just be some fluke. Like we've had people try to help in a case and then get yeah. locked up. It's just like, you know, I do understand there's no, they can't force you to do it unless they have a court order. And they did. And they, he was not a match. So he was let go and ruled out. So years went by um, and new sheriffs inherited the case. Over the years, suspects just kept um, getting ruled out because their DNA did not match uh, what was on Mandy's body. 
Then in 2009, a new detective took on the 4,000 pages of files on this case, which was now 20 years old. And shortly after that, a detective got inspired by a case in England where police did a DNA sweep to solve a murder case similar to Mandy's. And this is basically where they go door to door. And this case in England, they went door to door from and received samples from 5,000 men who volunteered. Uh, to give their samples and they had to be within a specific age and geographic range and they were able to solve the case that way and so you know this investigator sa- saw that and said what what a good idea so they got in contact with hundreds of men who fit the profile um in 1989 and lived near strand road at the time of mandy's killing and yeah. they went through all of these hundreds of samples that people volunteered kept coming up empty-handed like jeez n- no freaking answers and how many people did they get do you know uh, several hundred okay um so det- and again this is a small town i know i keep saying it but like in context there aren't that many people <laughs> yeah you'd hope that somebody would have matched you know but they were not able to figure it out so detectives continuously assured mary uh mandy's mother that their that her daughter's case would never go cold but mary just was not convinced uh she said she feared finding a new suspect would make her relive her daughter's death all over again sure and so she wasn't even sure what to think about this investigation going on after decades because she described it in 2020 sort of as like it's not going to bring her back it's not gonna you know she almost felt feeling defeated what's the point yeah exactly defeated and so it was year another set of years later before uh an unlikely lead popped up Okay. Dun, dun, dun. So now we're in June of 2013. And this is 25, I'm sorry, 24 years after Mandy's death. Their two friends, their names are Heather Backstrom and Mary Lee Anderson. And they took their kids to Birch Bay Water Slides, which is a water park in Blaine, Washington. Mm. They had actually grown up in Acme. And while they just chit chatted with each other uh, about their hometown, Mandy's murder came up. Um, I imagine it probably came up with a lot of people who were discussing their childhoods here during that time. Yeah. This was sort of like a casual, almost like gossipy conversation um, just to say like, wow, can you believe, you know, uh, what do you remember from the case? Can you believe the killer got away with it? Um, But according to CBS News, Backstrom, oh, I already have goose cam. Why? Heather Backstrom suddenly blurted out, I know who killed her. (gasps) And Mary Lee Anderson, stunned at the statement, then replied, I do too. <gasps> what? I know. I know. Okay, here we go. Yeah, 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 yeah. It turned out both women had had seriously weird encounters with the same local Acme man named Tim Bass, who was another Mount Baker High School alum. Okay. And let me like just uh, tell you their different experiences. So one night in the 90s, a few years after Mandy's murder... Tim Bass showed up at Heather's house uh, while she was home alone with her kids. Mm. He, yeah, already bad news. And by the way, it gets so much worse. So he tells her he's been out hunting and he needs to use her phone. So she lets him in, but she hears the deadline beeping on the other end of his call. Like he's not actually calling anyone. It's just like faking a phone call. Yes, exactly. And so she's like, what the hell? You know, she's obviously so uneasy and on edge. And then Tim walked into her bedroom and he told Heather he'd always been in love with her and asked her to sleep with him. Oh, okay. Yeah. And at this point, she's fucking terrified. She's home alone with her children. This man who who, who clearly lied to get in her front door is now invading her bedroom and is asking her to sleep with him. Clearly says he's been out hunting. I don't know if he has a gun on him or in the car. I don't know. But this it's just like a a very dangerous situation. So he said he used to drive by her house all the time. Mm. And he loved her. And he begged her to get in bed with him. And Heather told him she was going to call the police if he didn't go. And she later described, somehow, I don't even remember exactly how I got him out of my house. Thank (laughs) the Lord. But... Just one weird encounter, and this was just a couple years after Mandy's death. So she tells Mary Lee the story, and Mary Lee goes, okay, I have my own story about Tim. Months before Mandy's death in 1989, when Mary Lee was only 15, 
She was riding in the front seat of a truck um, sitting between uh, Tim Bass on one side and her boyfriend slash future husband uh, on the other side. Okay. And Tim was 21. Again, she was 15. And he kept hitting on her, um, even though she was with, you know, her boyfriend. And uh, he bizarrely took a pen out of the truck's cup holder and started running it along the edges of her eyes. What? and telling. Yeah, but which, by the way, I hope they don't go over a fucking speed bump. This is like, I know. sounds oh my God. dangerous. What, what happened next? He kept telling her how beautiful her eyes were and just like running the pen around her face. And so, uh, like, uh, just fucking great A creepy. Just cringe, creepy, Like, do you think it's, like, first of all, if there were no murderous intentions or evil intentions, still not still as bad. romantic and suave as you think it is. Still um, bad. Wow, just so dangerous and gross and ugh. and like invasive. Like, don't invasive. touch people. You know, yeah, especially um, with like the lightness, the gentleness of, like, of a pen. I like, I c- couldn't tolerate it. Simply it, couldn't. Horrible. And of course, being in an enclosed space like that, you know, what are you gonna do? Ugh. And so he's running this pen around her eyes and saying how beautiful they are. And she felt that she believed that the only reason this didn't escalate is because she had another male presence in the car with her and sure is nothing could happen but she was like i think it could have escalated into something worse if yeah. i if i were alone with him so for years heather and mary lee had these stories to themselves and they privately thought tim is just this weird predator who probably freaked other girls in the community out um and you know it wasn't hard to believe he could have hurt mandy given the opportunity especially because he's like pushing all these boundaries and like lying his way into women's homes and like trying to push physical contact on them um and he lived on strand road mandy's Mm. street uh so this was all very eerie and stuff but they were afraid to come forward and accuse someone in their small community especially with just like a story of how weird he was that is until they heard each other's stories and then they said we both need to come forward with this like they it's almost like they didn't realize other people had these same suspicions which I feel like that's like a, a lot of predators out there. Absolutely. One of their skills is making Absolutely. you feel alone in it. So. Absolutely. It's almost that gaslighting feeling of like, maybe I'm exaggerating it. You know, mm-hmm. maybe I was young and uncomfortable, but, and, and, and I'm def- I'm going to touch on that at the end as well. But um, that's exactly the point. It's, it's sort of like, you know, once they bolstered each other into saying, yeah. no, no, he's just as creepy as you remember. Uh, and I always had the same suspicion and that mm-hmm. moment of like, I know who killed her. So do I. And it happened to be the same guy. I mean, that's when Oy. they said we got to call the police. Yeah. So thankfully they, they reached out and um, called the police and said, we think Tim Bass is somebody to look into. Yeah. So Tim lived across the other side of highway nine on strand road in 1989. And Mandy used to jog past his house every single day. He graduated in 1986, which was three years before Mandy, and uh, he actually had a brother named Tom Bass who was friends with Mandy. So his younger brother was in the same social circles. His name was Tom. So it's a little confusing, Tim and Tom. Um, So Tom ran in the same social circles as Mandy, and Tim was always just kind of like the older brother that was in the background. Like he okay. wasn't somebody that they really socialized with. Um, Tim was also a bit of a loner and Mandy just wasn't known to really hang out with him. She's very sociable. He was several years older. Uh, Mandy's friends just remembered uh, Tim as Tom's older brother, a guy in the background. And in 1989, when the murder took place, he was living with his parents and his brother, Tom, and he was dating a high schooler named Gina Malone. Um, Gina is also interviewed in the 2020 episode. So Gina was not friends with Mandy, but she knew of her and saw her every day at school because they went to school together. Uh, Tim planned to marry Gina once she graduated high school. But when Mandy died, he suddenly seemed very anxious to get married and he rushed the wedding and they quickly got hitched. Uh, The two of them had three children together. And as Gina describes it, it's definitely very harrowing. Like you can just tell this still affects her to this day. She remembers Tim as a controlling, abusive husband. Mm. Uh, He dictated what she wore, whom she talked to. And he, instead of using her name, called her bitch and whore. Holy shit. If she ever said, I don't like when you call me that, he would basically say, oh, get a sense of humor, you know? And it's like, you get a sense of humor. That's right. uh, Get a brain. Get a fucking read a book. Yeah. (laughs) Take a um, hike. Take a hike. 
wake up and smell the coffee. You know? <laughs> smell a rose while you're at it. You know, smell as the, if. Yeah, as if whatever, loser. <laughs> so he sometimes mimed like he was about to hit her just to scare her i mean this guy is just a fucking grade a abusive asshole so it just sounds Um, like it runs in the family then that they uh that these are creepy folks oh this is just the same guy tim oh i thought we were talking about tom for a second no sorry tom was just a younger brother Um, of course as you said tim and tom it gets confusing i know i know i'm sorry so tim is the creepy one tom is his younger brother who was just friends with this friend group got it okay sorry tom (laughs) yeah poor tom (laughs) um so tim is the one who's abusive and controlling and he um marries this high school girl named gina he's very abusive toward her pretends to hit her he shoved her into a wall where she injured her back um and they used to watch shows like cold case files and he would always brag that he'd never get caught for murder and oh shit yeah, he told her the killers on the show were stupid and bad at covering their tracks, so they deserved to get caught. But for him, getting away would be easy. And hey, to be fair, it's been decades and nobody's caught him. So, you know, he's on to right. something, I gotta say. In 2010, Gina filed for a protective order for herself and her children against him, but eventually she dropped it and stayed with him. Uh, She was still married to Tim, actually, in 2013, when investigators showed up at their house and asked Tim for a DNA sample after Heather and Marilee had called in. Mm -hmm. So they brought up Mandy, and Tim acted like he didn't know who Mandy was, which this is a red flag because everyone in the community knows Mandy. Like, this was such a big story. Um, And he was trying to play it super blasé and cool. And he said, oh, is that the girl who was missing? Oh, I remember she was found in a river. Uh, and then when they asked for a DNA sample, he absolutely refused. Um, of course. Of course. And there wasn't enough probable cause for a warrant. So four freaking years went by. <gasps> nothing. They just didn't have a warrant to get Whoa. his DNA. And, and and so I imagine being the family, it's so hard. You're just like on the on the edge of getting an answer or a suspect. And then it's like years just go by. You know, it just sounds so... As a very impatient person myself. Exhausting. Sounds frustrating and exhausting. So four freaking years go by, and it's not until 2017 that police approached Tim's co-worker, Kim. Now we got a a rhyme. Oh, for fuck. Okay. (laughs) Tom and Tim, Tim and Kim. Tim and Kim. Kim works at the bakery where Tim works as a delivery driver. So police approach Kim, and she's... uh, She was 19 in 1989 when Mandy disappeared. And she knew the story very well. She's the same age as Mandy. And it often haunted her to think about Mandy's mother specifically and the way she never got closure about her daughter's death, especially because she was on all the news programs, talk shows. Um, But at this point, Kim has no idea why the police are approaching her because they didn't mention Mandy when they came and approached her. They only brought up Tim. Right. So when investigators asked her about Tim Bass and his DNA, she said, which I love, that it was above her pay grade and referred <laughs> them to HR. <laughs> like, thank Honestly, you. Honestly, good for her. Same, same. No, yeah. What the fuck? No. You know, it's like, I understand why they asked, but like, no. She's like, nice try. <laughs> getting mixed up in this bullshit unless yeah. you give me more information. So, of course, HR refused to work with police without a warrant. Also good for them. I mean, they mm-hmm. shouldn't just be handing over people's DNA without any sort of warrant or, or understanding of why. So, you know, this is just like starting to, you know, I, I give them credit for that. Um, but one day while Kim was chatting with a friend about Mandy's death, she found out that Tim used to live on Strand Road right by Mandy's house. And all of a sudden it clicked. And she's oh. like, oh, my God, that's why the police came to my work to talk about Tim, they must be investigating him for the crime. So at work, like her little detective self, she started observing Tim just from a <gasps> distance. I know. I, I love, love I love women. her. Me I too. love Aren't women. Aren't they the best? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not biased. I just want to say that. Okay. But you are bi. I, <laughs> I'm not biased. Uh, so <laughs> there's a shirt in there somewhere, but uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. you've write that down. Okay. So at work, she starts observing Tim. He never uh, left his uniform to be washed like everyone else did. So that was a odd 
Bless you, Gio. Because I'm tight. Oh, little baby Gio is there. <laughs> he just sneezed. He's just staring at me because he wants his lunch or his Aww. dinner. And it's 1.50 in the afternoon. It's not dinner time yet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he just waits all day. Very food motivated. Um, me too, Gio. And me too. Me three. So he never left his uniform behind like everyone else did to be washed. He always took his trash home with him. Like he didn't throw it away. He took it with him. He even wore gloves on his delivery route. And this is when she realized, oh, this man is guarding his DNA. Like clearly he Mm. knows that somebody is looking for it. So when detectives visited the bakery a second time, Kim asked outright, are you investigating Mandy's murder? And they were like, how did Uh you figure that out? (laughs) Like they just didn't. They didn't. Realized she would have put that together. Um, Gio, no, honey, I know. I gave him attention. Now he's like, dinner? Um, hey, again, <laughs> I understand as someone who craves food Aww. and attention at all moments. <laughs> also, it's his birthday this week. It was, was his birthday I Saturday. Know. He turned seven. He's, too, he's a 56 boy. year old man. Wait, 49. 49. 49. Seven, yeah. seven times seven. 49. Oh, you're about to have your half-life crisis. Midlife Somebody crisis. commented on his photo. Yeah, your midlife crisis. Someone commented on his photo like, oh, he's a senior dog now. I was like, don't tell oh, me that. Oh, no. No. Oh, he's when I met you, he was just a little cherub. He was turning one. He was turning one. That was the first That's time I ever met him. crazy. That is bananas. Oh, oh little Geo. So baby. sweet. Okay. Little puppy. Okay, anyway. sorry. That was. I hope everyone enjoyed their intermission. How are you, How are you doing, everyone? Let's did everyone get, back get a to sip the, of water? Yeah. Did everyone uh, take a moment to feel at ease? Well, yeah. let's get back into this. <laughs> <Okay>. uh, <laughs> so she realizes he's guarding his DNA. They come to the bakery. She's like, "Are you investigating Manny's murder? Tell me." And they're like, "Oh shit." Um, Kim was a mother, and she kept thinking about Mandy's mom with this heartache, and she told police. She would get a DNA sample, but police told her they couldn't officially ask for that. She would have to volunteer the evidence on her own accord. Now, this is a little sketchy to me. Like, I understand. Like, I don't I'm glad that they were able to get Tim's DNA, but I I don't necessarily love this like police work of, well, wink, wink. You have to Mm -hmm. volunteer it. Gross. We're not, you know what I mean? It's like, it just feels really shady to me. I, I don't love that. Um, but, you know, thankfully, at least in this case, it was for a good cause, so to speak. Yeah. Uh, so Kim watched him nonstop until one day she saw him throw away a plastic water cup. Done so. She grabbed it and delivered it to investigators. The odds of this being a match were one in 11 quadrillion. What? Because if if it weren't him, so to speak. So like oh, oh, oh. just a random match would be one in 11 quadrillion, which is 15 zeros. And guess what? It was a fucking match. So like this is their guy. No question. Wow. So investigators took him into custody and you can watch the interview with him online. He's like acting kind of skittish, but also like super casual, like he's going to like bluff his way out of it. Uh huh really unsettling um and once he realized they definitely had his dna he said quote i trust you guys if this comes back to bite me ah hell i slept with her (gasps) oh fucking asshole liar he told police that one day while he was mountain biking with his dad he ran into mandy on her usual jog and got to chatting with her and then they began a secret affair that only his dad knew about this is the most incel experience i've ever seen i know Horrifying. All the way down to, oh, we were talking. No, you were. And she probably was nice to you for five seconds. Yeah. And and none of this even really happened. I don't know. Oh, think. yeah. The secret love affair, I think, was all in his oh, head. Oh, for sure. It was all made up. Um, So they slept together. A le- this is according uh-huh. to him. They didn't actually. But he said they slept together several times before she moved away for college and once over Thanksgiving break, which was why his DNA was inside of her when searchers found her body. Uh-huh. He said they were friends at first who just talked a lot and then the relationship turned physical. But when investigators asked about Mandy's life, he didn't remember anything. They were like, well, what college did she go to? Uh, I don't know. What'd she major in? I don't know. Who were her friends? I don't know. Like he didn't know anything about her. So it's like you were friends and it turned like obviously you weren't because you would know the like, basics Even if you were her. just a hookup, you would know like how far know. away she lived from you or something. Yeah, or like, what school she went to or the name of her boyfriend that she's cheating on, you know, right, right, something. Right. 
Um, he's so investigators were obviously not convinced by this. And on December 12th of 2017, finally, he was arrested and charged with murder in the first degree. Now, the detectives drove to Mary's house and said, we've got him. Mm. It was Mary's 81st birthday. <gasps> I know. Whoa. And she opened the door. They said, we've got him. And she said, who? Like, it literally oh, didn't like, even sh- occur to her. She was also to like straight up see police. You'd think you're at least prompted to know what the to situation's know. about. Exactly. And they she, were, was, she so... was just so taken aback that this could have happened. Like, and yeah. it didn't even occur to her that they, after 30 years, that they could have found Mandy's killer. She had just resigned herself to the belief that like, just like yeah. her other son or her other child, this, she just wouldn't have answers. Yeah. So at a press conference, they announced the news. And of course, the community once again is like whiplash. Holy shit. Um, Kim said she planned to stay anonymous, the the w- woman at the bakery. But uh, Mary, uh, Mandy's mom, said she wanted to meet the person who helped catch Mandy's killer. So Kim agreed to meet with her and they have it on camera and tearfully. This makes me cry. Kim embraced Mary and said, I did it for you. Because it was always just such so hard for her to imagine um, Mandy's mom living without answers for so long. It's just, yeah. ooh, it gives me goose cam. So Tim's defense team uh, couldn't deny that Tim's DNA was found inside Mandy. So they had to try and convince the court that Mandy was in a consensual affair with Tim and only happened to sleep with him right before death. And it's just all such a big coinky dink, you know? How silly and convenient. How and silly everything. is that? Uh, basically, their argument was just because Tim's DNA was on Mandy didn't mean he raped or killed her. Um, so they also relied heavily on Gina, who's Tim's wife, um, who gave Tim an alibi. And she said that she saw Mandy jogging before her disappearance while she was driving to Tim's house and then spent the rest of the day inside with Tim. So there's no way Tim could have killed Mandy. Mm. Meanwhile, on the other hand, the Stavik family is adamant that Mandy would not have slept with Tim. Her sister said, to put it bluntly, he was miles below her league. <laughs> I was like, holy no. shit. Because everyone knew this guy is a creep, you know? Yeah. Like he's yeah. like he's like touching people's faces and like j- he's no, just, no, no, a- just the phrasing of oh, yeah. mi- miles, miles be- below her league. Yeah. I was like, wow, I've never heard such a sick burn. <laughs> it, indeed. And I hope she said it on the stand because yeah. what a powerful moment. Yeah. Uh, Mandy's friends testified that never once in their lives had they seen Mandy so much as talk to Tim. She had nothing to do with him. The idea that she'd run into him in the woods and then start cheating on her boyfriend with him seemed absolutely ridiculous. Like, yeah, on what planet? It just didn't make any sense. <laughs> Can we bring on back what on what planet? <laughs> I say that a lot, and I feel like I'm learning. I'm the only one who still says. That. I could. I'm happy to bring it back. That's I'm, a good one. That's I think I'm one. just like channeling Xenon. I'm like, on what planet? You know, mine. Yeah, on mine. <laughs> I don't think so. It's a mess. I haven't cleaned up for for visitors. Okay. So anyway, her garbage pile, like mine, is getting way too big. So <laughs> it's just frappuccino cups left and right. Okay, Mary. Sorry, I'm sorry. I don't know. You why kept you... picking moments when I was drinking. Water. I know. Well, why? you kept drink picking moments to I kept drink water. It was done. Okay, <laughs> it's anyway. never done. Mary Stavik, uh, who had celebrated her 81st birthday, finding out that you know they had caught the guy, was 82 when she took the stand. She was very afraid of reliving her trauma all over again. So she basically just answered all the questions very briefly, very straightforward. Sure. Um, her testimony about losing her daughter was just absolutely gut wrenching. Um, but the ultimate testimony came from Tim's own younger brother, <gasps> Tom, Tom's back, baby. Oh man. Tom he, came in swinging. He came in hot. He said after the investigator first asked for Tim's DNA, Tim came to Tom scared and said detectives were after him. He told Tom, the reason I'm so worried is because I slept with Mandy. And Tom was like, what? In fact, he said he couldn't believe Mandy would sleep with his brother. <laughs> He's like, isn't she miles below your league? Yeah, right, right. That's what she told me. I mean, on, not on this planet, but on, on one. what planet, sir? <laughs> so Tim was like, oh, well, only dad knew about this, but now dad's dead, so he can't defend me. So he says, Tom, I need you to defend me and say that I slept with Mandy and I want what? you to help make her look quote unquote loose <gasps> yeah what a bastard 
He said that that way would look more believable that Mandy slept with him in the first place. I want you to victim blame. Yeah. Uh, until they believe she's not a victim. Until they believe. Yeah, exactly. It, uh, yep. Um, so heartbroken, Tom had to make the decision whether to lie for his brother or testify against him. And he deeply believed his brother was guilty. So he went ahead and testified against him. And I'm, you know, I'm not doubting how hard this must have been for for him to do. Um, he said in court it was difficult to be there, uh, but he had to do it. Um, I imagine that was very sleepless time for yeah. him. Yeah, yeah. Um, worse for Tim, guess who else came back? Miss Gina. <gasps> okay. Mm -hmm. She came forward and she said when she originally provided an alibi for him that day, she was terrified of Tim. She thought I could be next. So everything he said to her, she just agreed and said she did it out of fear he might kill her or hurt their children. And now that he was in custody, she filed for divorce and she testified that the alibi was all a lie all along. He was an abusive bastard etc etc so Jeez. the jury ultimately declared tim bass guilty of first degree murder they sentenced him to 320 months in prison which is 26 years Whew. and he maintained his innocence during sentencing and said he had no ill will for anyone in the courtroom that day okay well okay. it's not not saying back at you right. uh, <laughs> <laughs> he's still in prison so there's that and um, according to Heavy.com, Mandy's sister Molly said the trial felt like her sister died twice, which is mm. just horrific. Um, and I I'm just going to read this little paragraph here, which just shows like the family's heartbreak. She said, it's like a wound that just won't heal. It's starting to heal and it's got all the scar tissue. You can see it every day. And then all of a sudden they literally rip the scar tissue off the wound and reopen it. And so it's this raw uh. pain that we had to deal with all over again. But I think now we can slowly start healing, growing. Mm. So as like a final, um, oh gosh, the story is just like, gives me chills. Um, as a final kind of side note, I just want to touch on one thing that you had mentioned earlier, which is like this, the fact that these two women who shared their stories suddenly felt emboldened enough to yeah. step forward. And apparently a lot of the articles about this case sort of describe it as like gossip led to the arrest Ew. of a killer, but it, it feels a little bit like dismissive. Um, right. And I feel like the bigger takeaway is that you know women like we talked about like that gaslighting feeling of like women girls um are, are people who identify that way are so often like not only the victims of these incidents whether they're like murder or just like creepy invasive touching or rape or whatever it may be but then on the flip side like somehow convinced that they need to keep that to themselves or that yeah. they're the only one or they must be confused or, you know, it's just this like constant cycle. And it, uh, even like the subtle power dynamic of like, oh, I felt like something was wrong, but maybe I shouldn't say something just to be safe. I was trying to be polite or yeah. Yeah. Or, or just to protect my safety. It's just this constant cycle of like being made to doubt your experience. And, you know, I mean, I think a lot of us have been there. Um, for sure. And this is where I bring up yet again, um, Gavin De Becker's book, uh, The Gift of Fear. Be and, and you can listen on Audible. And I actually recommend it because he has like a new, the book was written in the 90s. So some of it's kind of outdated, but the Audible version, he does like a post COVID forward where he discusses oh, wow. like how things have changed, how they've stayed the same. Um, and so it's, it's just such a great book. And it really, the whole, his whole career is meant to help teach primarily women to trust their instincts and to trust their guts. And that if something feels off, a lot of times that's because it is. And your subconscious is trying to tell you your, your innate like sense of fear or survival mode is trying to tell you and we override it. And so just an important note um, I wanted to, to mention. And um, you know, if it, if it were safer or easier for women to come forward, I think um, you know, it could have been, happened sooner that this Tim guy was, was arrested. Gotcha. Um, so, you know, and there's more Tims in the world, unfortunately. So this is just like a, a sign to, you know, trust your gut, trust your gut, everyone so to speak, see something, say something, trust your gut, uh, be, be safe out there, be, be safe out there. On okay. what planet? Not this one. <laughs> um, no, oh, wait. Yeah. Great point. <laughs> uh, 
Wow, that was a good one. I was, I mean, I always hate when I say that was a good one and like what that sounds like, but I I enjoyed learning about I'm it. I'm so glad because I think it's a really powerful story and um, you know, it's one of the few where at least a cold case finally gets some justice, you know. Yeah, and the family, I know it sounded like they it felt more like an opening wound, mm-hmm. opening a wound than closure, but I am glad that they at least got an answer. Yeah. And it sounds like they they were even recognize at least her sister that like maybe this will finally lead to more healing. So, yeah, let's hope. Yeah. Let's hope. Um Hmm. Wow. You know, and, well, and running with a German shepherd like Yeah. You'd think a lot of people think, "Oh, well, I'm safe because I have a dog," but yeah. I, I mean Oh. I don't want to scare anybody, but no, you know, no. it just goes to show you that you can't you can I would be have as thought safe the same, as possible. I and, would have thought the same thing, you know, like you're running with a a dog, you're running with another do- who knows like who what precautions, but something can always happen. So, yeah, be, you, be you alert. Can be, you can do everything you can and sometimes people just fucking suck. Sometimes yep. people just want to fuck it up anyway. Yep. Um <sighs> Boy, well, thank you for that. It's You're for so educating welcome. me. I yeah, thank you for that horrible experience, you're but so thank welcome. you for the education. Oh, um, you're so welcome. Am I am I seeing you uh tomorrow to record? What's the situation? Oh, we're doing rituals tomorrow, baby. Ooh, 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 okay. Ooh, ooh. Well, if you guys don't listen to rituals, we're really proud of it. It's um only yeah. on Spotify. We, we just, never talk about it. No, we, really we never should. do. We're 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 having a great time over there and they do such I mean not that anyone could do more better, awesome research than we do, but they, okay. the, <laughs> LOL, <laughs> the podcast team does amazing research and it's all about like the occult. And um, we did one on astral projection, which got me back into my lucid dreaming. So, you know, if you're interested in this, the kind of more spooky or paranormal, um, occasionally sprinkle of like true crimey stuff, um, go check out Rituals. We have a great time. Yeah, it's very fun. It's got, I think, a little bit of a different feel. It's definitely our our banter is more restricted. Is limited. Because other people are watching us, and they're probably as we talk, just like scratching out the time out. codes. <laughs> but we do. But, they do give us a lot of room to like banter and joke, and you know, tell stories of like. I think we even in some ways get more room because there are like questions that we are prompted with like hey yeah. have you ever done a hex on someone and i went on a 10 minute rant about how yes i have done a hex on someone <laughs> or what's your experience with astral projection and so we de- we do get to kind of dive into more it's of those topics controlled chaos controlled chaos but TM, if you TM, do TM. Li- if you like and that's why we drink i mean there it's rituals is very similar so i would say yeah. i would say so, for anyone who's out there being like, oh, I'm all caught up. Like, what do I do? Go listen to Rituals. Check it out. I We, we think you might like it. Yeah. We should probably talk about it more. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm like, we think it's okay. We love it. But hopefully you do too. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, I guess I'll see you tomorrow to record then too. And Yay. also if you are on our Patreon, please go check our after chat after this. Oh, yeah. We're going to so. chat more. If you can't get enough of us talking Woo-hoo. nonstop. <laughs> right. All right. Uh, and? That's? Why? We drink. (laughs)